Well, welcome, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be doing scrimshaw. And so scrimshaw is a traditional art form that we've seen, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen in your respective villages. Um, a lot of artists like to use that to draw designs on items such as caribou antler, uh, ivory. I actually have a couple examples of each of those here today. Um, today you guys are going to be doing scrimshaw on ivory. Um, a major component of that is going to be the sanding. We're going to be taking time to sand the items down in steps. So that's really important to take it down in steps. We'll be starting coarse and we'll be moving finer and finer grits of sandpaper. Um, caribou antler a little bit and ivory especially almost gets a mirror-like appearance. Once you get it down to that fine, even without polish or anything, you could hold it up and it'll actually reflect, which is really cool. Um, and that's kind of be the, the, the direction we're going to be going for the first part of the day. And then we're going to be working on using our scribes. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later once we do a more in-depth. Um, I'll show you guys kind of a close-up of the different tools and different items we're going to be using today. So the caribou antler, the sandpaper, um, and I'm going to switch to the hand view here so you can see. Uh, there's going to be these metal scribes. There should be enough for everybody to get one. Um, you're going to need that. So we're going to be doing the scrimshaw. So actually, if you can see, I have it laid out here. Um, gloves are going to be for when we're applying ink and dealing with the polish. The cheesecloth that you have in there are also going to be for when we're applying the ink and doing the polish. Uh, of course, you're going to need the polish here. Everyone should have a tube of this. A bottle of this. This is India ink, and you should have some of that. The scribe, the antler, and the sandpaper. Um, first off, we're going to need... The sandpaper and the antler are going to be the two most important things here we need to start the class. And then to go with that, um, there should be dust masks, safety goggles, and I would recommend the students using the plastic aprons for today. And I will go ahead and start going through this. So, of course, today we're going to be doing um, scrimshaw. Now, scrimshaw has been practiced all over the country. Um, is very popular with whalers, especially on the East Coast, where they would do scrimshaw into the uh, teeth of whales. And a little bit later, I will bring up some exam examples of that. Uh, today, you see a lot of scrimshaw in the native arts markets, a lot of the art shows. Um, artists are using that to uh, design, you know, put designs onto uh, antler, to uh, knife handles, um, berets. They're, they're, they're putting it on. I mean, there's, there's a lot of artists who will take uh, full um, walrus tusks and I'm going to actually go back to this. They'll do full walrus t uh, head mounts and they'll have uh, beautiful designs going down the tusks uh, done, done with scrimshaw. Um, it will take some practice, you know, getting used to the resistance as you're trying to use the scribe through the material. Um, it definitely gives you a little bit of um, resistance as you're trying to go. Uh, a lot of times, though, I've, people have actually started using some really fine point Dremel bits to be able to do their scrimshaw. So instead of using the hand tools, they're using Dremel. Uh, of course, today we're going to be using the hand tools. Um, be careful because they are sharp as well. So I'm going to go ahead and go through uh, the tools and some of the things that we're going to be using today, going back to the hand cam. Of course, we've got our antler pieces. Everyone should have at least a piece of antler here. Um, all of your pieces, I did a rough grind on them just to kind of get the one side. So you're going to want to use this side. You're not going to want to use the inner side. If you can see the inner side is a really porous. Um, but if you look on the outer part of the antler, it's going to be really smooth. That's the side you're going to want to use to work with. Um, I ground down a little bit. And then we're going to finish sanding today. The sanding part is actually the part that I really want people to get a little bit of practice with because on our final project, when we do the masks, we're going to be using uh, the sandpaper for the masks. Uh, we have a couple different sandpapers. Everybody should have gotten a packet or two packets of a, a variety of different grits. Uh, when it comes to doing scrimshaw, you want to start off with the rough grit. You're going to just kind of smooth things down. That helps things kind of level out. So this is the 80 grit sandpaper here. You can tell it's got a little bit of a little bit of a rougher texture to it, the bigger grains. That's made for mostly removing material. Um, that, you know, when it comes to wood and it comes to antler, using that 80 grit, you're really gonna take a lot of material off really fast. And so today, since the caribou antler already has a rough grind on it, we're not gonna use this too much. We are gonna do it just a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna start stepping up into the finer grits here. I'm gonna move this over. Uh, right here, I have 120 grit sandpaper, and as you can tell, it's a little bit finer compared to the 80 grit. 
this again, well, it'll remove a little bit of material, but you're stepping down, so you're not going to be removing as much. The reason we want to step down like this is that the the larger grooves that you that you're going to get the kind of uh, rough parts, you're going to slowly take those out and smooth it out as you go, and it's really important to do that with the you know just kind of stepping down in the grits, and it takes a little bit of time. So the first part of class, we're going to be sanding for a little while. This right here is the 180 grit. Um, your grit sizes might vary. I had to kind of switch it up based on what was at the hardware store. Um, of course, supply issues, everyone's got some different products. Um, 180 grit, and as you can see, we're starting to get really fine. Um, again, 180 grit is not quite finishing. It's more of a medium grain. Um, this is, again, gonna remove mat more material, but you're not gonna be removing as much. You're going to be taking out some more of those grooves, some more of those uh, rough parts. And then we're gonna start getting into the the finer grits this is 220 grit this is more of a finishing sandpaper um, the 220 grit is you've already kind of roughed everything out you know you're you've taken a few steps down and you're starting to go okay it's time to start finishing the off and make it really smooth and once you start using this higher 200 grit plus sandpaper you or yourself are going to be able to feel how smooth these things come out to you you're not going to notice with your fingers that you're not going to be able to feel much of those ridges um, and like, you know, right now this ivory piece that I have has a bunch of ridges on it from the saw and that once I start sanding it down, those will all go away. And then this right here is a 400 grit. So this is going to be the final one that I have today. This is the one that's going to be kind of really polishing it up. Um, I've even used 800 grit sandpaper before. They have 1200 grit sandpaper. Those are really going to give you a really nice, fine finish on any of the items that you're sanding. Um, when it comes to ivory and caribou antler, it's when you start getting up into that 800 grit that you really start putting a nice polish um, on it. And it's, it's amazing how shiny these items can get just using sandpaper, um, be, even before we use the polish here that we're going to use later. Um, it gets to the point where almost you can see your reflection as you, as you uh, work with the items. Um, so first off the bat, that's going to be the first things that we're going to be doing. We're going to be taking our, our items, our antler pieces, and sanding them down, um, smoothing them out, and then stepping up in the grits to kind of give that really nice fine finish. Uh, that fine finish is also going to help when you go to use the ink. When you put the ink on after you use your scribe to etch your, etch your drawing into this uh, piece, the ink is a lot easier to wipe off if you don't have any of those rough ridges. You know, it won't get into any of the other cracks. That smooth finish will help that, that ink kind of wipe right off and the ink will just adhere into the scratches. So I've talked about these guys right here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move over a little bit and these are kind of gonna be some of the main tools. So this is a scribe. Now this can be used to etch glass. It can be used to etch, etch metal. Um, it's got a very fine point to it if, if you can see those. Um, and while you guys are sanding, I will ask the teachers probably to get the rest of this stuff ready to hand out. But for right now, we're just going to be worried about the sandpaper and the antler. Um, these fine pieces, these actually are removable tips. So each of you get to take this home with you. If I can get this out. Well, I can't really get that out right now. Um, but these are removable tips. You can, you can pull these out and swap the bits and some of the um, packages you guys got came with extra bits. Um, they also have actually magnetic ends too on them. So if you ever drop the piece, you can actually use the back end and pull that out. Um, once we get done doing the sanding and then you, you, you draw on with pencil on your, your design, you scribe it in. And then once you get done scribing it, we're actually gonna use this. This is called India ink. This is a very dark form of ink here. They have different colors you can use. Um, I will, I will put that up there and everyone should have got one of these two in their packages. Um, you use this little dropper and you put this into the etchings and then you can use a piece of this cheesecloth cheese that you're gonna have too to rub that ink through and it's gonna take, that ink's gonna seep into the little etchings that you made. Once you let that sit there for a little bit, you take this polish that I have here and you drop a little dollop of polish on it so you'll see it'll be like black, it'll be interesting that you know you can't really see your etchings you put that dollop of the polish on there and then you wipe it off and all the ink will come off the rest of it and then just be stuck in the etchings. And once we get to that point, I'll actually do a couple examples of the etchings and, and, and then show you how that kind of works there too as well. Um, I recommend using gloves when you go to do the ink. Uh, that's something that you're gonna wanna do to protect your hands. That ink will get on anything and it'll stain, so be careful. Um, you guys might wanna use some car the cardboard, same cardboard pieces you used uh, last time as well for that. 
just so you don't get any on the table or even just a piece of paper or something to help protect the table. Um, but I highly recommend using gloves. And then everyone should have gotten some cheesecloth too. Uh, this is gonna be really good um, to go through and apply the ink and then wipe the polish off and kind of help you polish your pieces when you're done. So with that, I will go ahead and say, let's uh, get everybody started on doing some sanding. So go ahead and take your pieces and I want you to take your rough grit, the 80 grit, the, the you know, the whatever the lowest grit that you have and start taking your pieces and sanding them down. And I will work with you guys too as we, as we go and do that. Um, that'll take a little bit of time. And here in a few minutes, I'll probably talk about moving up to the next grit because like I said, these were had a rough grind on them and we're not gonna need to sand with the, the, the low grit too much. So feel free to go ahead and get started on that. And uh, I guess if Margie has any great stories or anything she'd like to, you know, uh, pass on to us while we're working here, it would be a good time to do it now too. Hey Margie, do you have um, any background on um, when we use our natural materials or we're working with animal pelts or, or bone, um, just some things about wastefulness and um, respecting the, the animal? I will uh, talk about um, some, I had told um, the, about the kinachluk, the mask. The Kinachluk, because they had extra time a long time ago, and they wanted um, to uh, perform during a very special time. The men um, came up with masks, and um, from what I was told, masks told a story and most of the masks were um, made from natural surroundings so after this um, carving class spring is around the corner some of you that live near um, beaches can pick up um, um, wood pieces to carve on you could also, um, I don't know if you guys know how to uh, burn wood, but you could create art uh, with some of the uh, natural um, wood that uh, goes up on your uh, shore. Our ancient people found ways to make use of everything they kept busy all day long. There was no electricity, so there, there was no uh, television, no internet, absolutely nothing for them to entertain themselves. So the um, ancient folks back then, especially the men that used to carve Right now it's a uh, universal, most anybody could carve because I carved before too and I found it to be very entertaining, very relaxing for myself. But when um, ladies were making dolls, they made a little face miniature and with um, scraps of fur, and scraps of um, material, they made the doll clothing. Most of the ancient folks did not believe in waste. They saved most anything that could be used again and created some of the most fascinating articles, some of them being dolls, some of them being masks and uh, some being children's toys, little boats, and they um, made sure that they um, made sure that they uh, did things properly. 
always with a mind that uh, if you start a project, try to complete the project and um, go on to the next one. That, that was their main focus. And when a person is doing a project, they have to do it as best as they can, not rushing, because the end result will tell elders what kind of person you are. Well, that's what I was told. Um, an elder can see by your pro project what type of person you might be. If you're uh, lazy or you don't care too much, then it'll reflect on your artwork or your project that you um, worked on. And so um, about waste, for example, back a long time ago when I was a little girl, there was abundance of caribou here in Nustuya Hawk and most everything was used from the caribou. The legs of the caribou were made and dried for kamuksaks. Kamuksaks is a makluk that uh, was worn back then. Some of you probably have a pair or have seen a pair uh, that was made traditionally made, but um, women in my area had mukluks that went all the way almost to their hip, and men theirs went up underneath the knee because men back then ran after caribou's and uh, ran behind a dog sled. And women were more sedentary. They sat and sewed. They sat and cut up um, food for the day, that kind of thing. I think someone has their hand up maybe for you, Justin. I see that. Hey, Port Hyden, how can I help you? Meshik, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I'm going to step out of the room. There's a lot of sanding going on in there. Um, we had some questions about the uh, sanding parts of the antler. Can you hear us clearly? Okay, fantastic. So the... Uh, some of our antler pieces have that white band down the middle like yours does. And some of the ways they were cut left them mostly um, with the exterior antler piece. Do you recommend sanding off till we see that white part of the bone? So some, some, of the, some of the antler have a little bit of a darker. So if you can see right here, avoid using this part right here. Um, but when I was taking cutting up the antler, some of them are gonna have a slightly darker appearance. So you can see this actually has a slightly darker appearance. Is that what you're talking about? Yes and no. Let me see if I can get my camera on here. Some of them look like this, where there's a clear white band on the middle. And others look more like this, where they've got raw exposed bone on the outside edge. Do you recommend trying to sand off everything or do you want it to just be kind of up to the artist's choice? That's that's the artist's choice. Um, I had to I had to kind of become creative with some of my antler pieces. Um, you know, antler for it was about fifty students where it was like trying to you know get a little pieces. So um, some of those flatter pieces that have like the raw exposed like that, um, the students you know I tried to grind off a, a spot like this for them to be able to use on those. And if they feel like they want to uh, take off that extra raw bit, they can. Um, that would be a bit of sanding, so they're going to have to work at it if they want to do. Um, but are they feel free to use just that exposed part that's already there? So that's totally fine. That's up to the that's up to the students. That's up to the artist. Okay. 
And then just to talk. Right, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And then just to talk about that too. So some of them are going to have slightly darker pieces like this. So you can see I'm a, it's a little bit lighter here and it gets darker. Um, but that's fine. That actually is going to resemble more like um, a fossilized ivory and stuff like that. That's always a little bit darker and that'll etch just fine. And it, the, the dark black lines will still come out on it just fine. And actually what I've seen artists do before is sometimes when you have a couple different tones, they actually work that into. So if you look at this piece, if I wanted to, you could almost make like a water scene here. And then the darker piece could actually be like a land scene. So you can actually use that to your advantage as you're carving, you know, uh, use this, use some of the imperfections and some of the materials to your advantage. Uh, sometimes I've had uh, knots in wood that I didn't know were there when I'm carving down and I actually just made them into like eyeballs, like a little, the knot I had turned into like the eye of the piece that I was doing. Um, so there's a couple of different things you can do there. Um, and, and just before we let Margie get back into it, I was going to say, if you feel like you guys are, uh, you're smoothed out enough, uh, it's up to, you know, move up to the next grain of, uh, sandpaper there, go ahead and step it up. I've already kind of stepped up a few different times. Um, here in a little bit, I will show an example of etching just to kind of give you guys an idea of what we're going to do. And I know it's a little hard to tell in this room, but actually starting to get a little bit of a shine on mine. It's starting to reflect a little bit of light. And so that's kind of what you're wanting to see. Um, and so, yeah, we'll go ahead and go there and feel free to step up in grits as you need. Um, uh, all right, Margie, thank you. I'll, I'll leave it back to you. Okay. <clears throat> I forgot where I was, but I'll, I'll talk about waste and, um, <clears throat> how useful everything was and women were very good at, um, saving everything that they uh, put their hands on. They saved scrap of fur, they saved materials for future use. I used to wonder why um, my grandmother always said, don't waste. I find out today now that I'm older Back then, this is like um, 70 to 100 years ago when my uh, grandmother was a child, they had most difficult time being able to get supplies. They did a lot of trading. That's how they got their beads. Um, men that went out fur trapping, would sell their fur and that they'd uh, trade for items that they um, didn't have. And one of the things that they were able to get was beads. And they were really treasured because their um, ability to get them, they'd have to wait another year to be able to get um, anything in the future. And back then when um, talking about preserving and reusing items, <clears throat> flour and sugar are mainly flour came in a cotton sacks, printed cotton sacks. When the um, flour was uh, gone, they'd use that material that the uh, flour was in. They'd clean it up, they'd wash it. And they had um, material that they could reuse for something very nice. And one thing that um, as a young girl, I remember getting was a homemade dress. I must have been about seven. And what my grandmother did back then was uh, she, she had saved these um, sack cloths, colorful, printed. Once they were washed, they, they looked really nice, brand new. And she uh, created me a dress. I wish I could have, um, I was young, I, I didn't know better, but um, that was uh, probably the last dress she ever made out of a um, 
sackcloth. That's what um, these older women saved everything for uh, use in the future. A lot of the potatoes that they traded for came in uh, some kind of burlap sacks. And they didn't throw these sacks away. They cleaned them and they used those for um, fish storage. Back then, it, uh, most of the stuff that they got didn't come in plastic. And plastic today is most abundant, but back then, the, like the burlap sacks were woven. They were like very coarse, um, very coarse rope or, um, but they used that sack for storage. And one of the things that they stored was, um, according to this one elder, he would fill a sack like that full of um, blackberries. They'd pick in the fall time until that um, burlap sack was filled. And then they just leave it on top of the tundra. Snow is coming and snow, they put a marker. Back then they didn't have refrigerators or freezers, but they'd fill that um, sack too heavy to uh, carry back to where they came from or to their home, but out on the tundra or around the um, forest area. They'd have that sack full of berries with a marker. And then in the winter, when the snow came and uh, it's time to gather the uh, sack, the guys would look for their mark marker on the tundra and retrieve the berries. They'd lift that big sack into the sled and bring it home and um, They'd have a kudak whenever they wanted from that um, big sack of um, burlap. But back then, everything was so treasured. Nothing was wasted. Even um, today, if you watch, like there's no more elders here. There's just my mother and um, her cousin, they're both in their 80s. My mother's going to be 84, and that lady is going to be probably 84 or 85 this coming month. But those two ladies, if, if they were able to, and they were given a whole king salmon, a big king salmon, practically everything that... Um, King Sam, that King Salmon would be used. The head part, they'd clean the gills out, they'd clean the teeth out, soak it in water, get all the um, slime off for a couple of days, and then they'd um, put it into containers. Nowadays we have uh, plastic um, buckets they put heads into a bucket with salt, rock salt. And then the tail, the tail part of the king salmon, they would take the tail part, flay it, cut off the tail and flay one side and flay the other side and get a matching one. And they'd hang that and they would uh, have it dry for a couple of days and then smoke for a couple of days. And that's what they call gum chalk. So head tail is taken care of. Now the internal, the um, internal parts of the king salmon, the one thing that they would probably, if it was a female, the eggs, 
they take that, they take the throat of the king salmon, and the only thing that would be discarded would probably be, I'm thinking, um, the liver or the lung. I, I don't know what the, uh, probably the liver would be discarded. And they'd probably make um, like caviar with the um, fish eggs, with the throat, that uh, sack, they boil that. And I've heard some people take that um, king salmon uh, throat, cut it in half and wash it, brine it and uh, dry it and eat it sometime later. Now the whole king salmon then would be flayed into strips and hung and dried and smoked. But there's also a meat part of the king salmon. Back then, women would take most of the meat from the king salmon off and hang that. They call that kernak. The kernak part of the king salmon is very delicious. Um, and uh, they dried that and smoked it, and, and it was like a fish jerky. Now we're down to the bone. The bone part then is tied up, matched to another uh, king salmon similar to it, and hung for dogs. That's how, that's everything used in a king salmon no waste and margie's making me hungry <laughs> i think Justin, you might have had a couple questions in the chat yeah i answered a couple questions here um wondering when you when the the pieces might be done so uh the first part of it is you want to make sure that they're smooth no visible scratches when you go to look at them um i would actually like you know i would hold them up kind of get an eye on it take a look at it and just make sure that you know that this is really nice and smooth um you run your finger across it. Your fingers are very, very good at finding little tiny, you know, um, ridges or anything like that, that you, you don't feel anything that it's just like smooth, almost like glass, you know, like really glass smooth. And actually when you go to like, look at it, if you kind of, you know, twist it a little bit, you'll actually see it'll start to reflect some light. Caribou antler, it's a little bit duller than ivory will be. Um, but ivory was really gets almost like mirror. Like when you hold up ivory, that's been really sanded down. You can actually see like, you know, get a little bit of your reflection in it. Um, but that's when you're going to know that your pieces are, are close to being done. Um, it's also something that I always say is when you think you're done, sand a little bit more. It doesn't hurt to polish it a little bit more, sand it a little bit finer with the fine grit, just to make sure you just really want that to be nice and smooth because that's going to help you in the long run. Um, and here in a little bit, I will have some examples of scrimshaw that I will, I will throw up because I, you know, people are probably getting close to wanting to figure out what they're going to draw. Um, so the students are going to take, you know, a, a pencil, um, you know, maybe sketch on a piece of paper first, but draw what you're going to want to etch into your piece onto your, onto your, uh, antler. Um, you know, uh, and even for this, if you felt like you just wanted to, to draw your name, that's totally fine. I, I just want you to get the experience of what it is like to etch into these items, um, and how the process goes. And so, you know, we'll, we'll go with that and it's going to be artist choice. Um, so I'll let Margie, uh, keep going. Hey, Margie, while you're talking, do you mind if I share my screen and I can show the, some examples of some scrimshaw as well? You know, I don't mind any anything. This is your class, and uh, I'm happy to just jump in and rattle while you guys, when I have the chance to. And when you do that, then I will be looking for that other story I thought I had around here for uh, Monday. That sounds great. Okay. So I, I will pop up some examples real quick so everybody can kind of see what we're going to be looking at here. Um, we've got some beautiful, I mean, there's a lot of great artists in this state and we've got some beautiful pieces here and, uh, I hope you guys can see it. I'll, I'll, I'll do full screen here. Um, you know, definitely you got some old, you got some definitely older pieces here. This is actually, it looks like a very, you know, an antique piece here. Um, people like to do whole tusks as you can see here. Um, and I will scroll down because there's some closer versions here. Very intricate designs. And this is where I was talking about they have colored ink that you can use as well. And so you can actually scrimshaw and colored ink. I know we see a lot of uh, black and white pieces, um, but people also will do this as well. Um, a lot of the times people will put whole scenes in 
as you can tell, it looks like some hunters here and some walrus. Um, and they can actually use it as accent. Scrimshaw can be accent to other pieces that you may carve. Uh, as you can see here, they've used it for the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Um, and you can kind of see that as we go. Uh, a lot of the time people will do animals, do full scenes, do hunting scenes, um, geometric designs. I've seen amazing de just geometric designs kind of coming through. Um, this is a gorgeous piece right here. Um, let's go ahead and I'll see if I can't pull that up so you guys can see that. Uh, a mammoth piece. I mean, you know, scrimshaw mammoth piece. And you can see how they do the shading. So this is actually a little bit difficult. And, you know, I... I'm going to show you guys how to do a little bit of just some easy shading for your pieces as well. And as you can see, you know, they got this nice, nice ma mammoth piece there. So I can go ahead and leave this up as you guys think about um, what you might want to draw on your pieces before you etch them. And um, if, you know, I can go through two here shortly and we'll uh, show you just some, you know, I, the little piece of antler I sanded down, I'm just going to do some basic lines in that just to show you that, you know, the different pressures that you use that are going to kind of uh, show, you know, the how dark the lines are. Um, and then we do a little bit of like shading, some cross hatching that'll be some shading there. So I'll go ahead and do that. So stop sharing my screen here. Hey, Margie, um, with the, when you're talking about waste, or, or, or do you have anything else to add with that? Are you okay for now? Yes, I'm okay for now. Okay, sounds good. I will go ahead and go back to the hand cam, everybody. And I actually, so I just kind of uh, drew some basic lines on here. And we're going to go ahead and do some etching. So I'm going to kind of show you that. We're gonna start, the first one I'm gonna really press down on that and get a really good line to it. And you're gonna actually probably hear the resistance as I go, it'll start to scrape as you go. And you can see it kind of, my hands kind of jumping a little bit cause I'm really pressing on that. Do it another pass here. And then we're gonna lighten it up just a little bit. And I'll do a really light one there. And so actually when I do that etching, so it was really nice, nice and smooth finish. And now that I've etched across my pencil lines there, you can feel just the ridges, the, the deep pockets that you just created there. And throw some gloves on for this one. And what's great about this is, you know, even if you go to like, sometimes, you know, you draw something you want to erase, you can definitely erase that and your stuff's still going to be there, but you can actually almost sand it down too that's the great thing about using this this kind of material is that when we do this you don't like something that you had you drew on there and you can't really get rid of it take the sandpaper back out and sand it back down again and it'll erase it just fine and when you go to do scrimshaw so even though i mark made these deep etches here if i did want to wipe it away i take my low grit sandpaper the really heavy stuff and i sand it down again and just start over and it you know erases what you were just doing there so we're gonna go ahead and I did some different lines there and use the dropper and we're gonna drop some of the ink here. Take, you know, a little piece of cheesecloth. I'm actually using little uh, bandage wipes here and we're gonna go ahead and put that in. And so you can see it's kind of spread all over the area here. let that go for a little bit and then I'm going to add the polish and it'll actually remove the ink from everything but the etch marks so a little dab of that and we're going to go ahead and do this and actually I'm going to, this is a really something to show you too here because I put a little ink on the unfinished edges there and you're going to see that the ink will actually adhere to those unfinished edges. So that's why you want it to be really nice and smooth. So as you can see, even though I put the ink there, I just wiped it all away. And this is what you're left with. This is Scrimshaw. So you can see that the line that I did really hard and I pressed down a lot is dark, really, you know, got that really nice and pronounced. And I stepped it down. 
not as heavy and it not as not as firm a pressure as I was etching and it comes out a little bit lighter and even you know a little bit lighter and then this one you can kind of just barely see and so that's kind of why you do that now the unsanded portion as you can see even though I was trying to wipe that away that's still on there so that the ink wipes away better if you've got a really nice smooth glass finish but this unfinished edge that I put the ink on that's stuck there now I'd have to I'd have to sand that down to get rid of that um, and so really that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be taking your pieces drawing on them and you'll use your little etching pens to etch that image in there to make it a more permanent and put the ink on there and then we'll wipe the ink away and this is what you're left with so that's pretty much what scrimshaw is there and I'll work on another piece too here as we go we're going to do a little bit of cross hatching so now that I did these really lightly this is kind of what you can use for shading do some really light really close marks there and then flip it around and go the other direction so I'm not doing it super heavy doing it fairly light drop my ink on there and this is why you want to use the gloves because you don't want that ink to get on your hands it just stain your fingers we're going to go ahead and add some more ink to that and let that sit for a minute oh so we have a question um do you ink as you go i actually would just wait until you're done etching so draw your your entire image out um, make sure it's the way that you want to do it and i would start etching and do all the etching at once and then i would ink it and then do uh, the ink all in one stage after, after you're done. Um, and it's really cool though. Once you get this done and then you go to wipe it away, it's just like, you know, you just see this, this black mass here and then you go to wipe it away and all of a sudden there's your picture, like there's your image. And it's really cool how that works. So now that I've got that in there, I'll add some more of that polishing compound and I'll polish that away. And as you can see here, we got like a little, almost like a lattice, a net pattern right there and then a little bit harder to see and you can actually use that pattern as shading so if your piece needed a little bit of shading you could go ahead and do that and what's really cool is that even though i'm using this to polish that ink stays in your etches that's that's what creates that it goes into those little etch marks and it stays there and again you can sand this down again so i did that little very light piece that kind of looks like it would almost be shading and i could take uh, maybe not quite the 80 grit, but I'll go down a little bit and I can actually wipe that away. I can sand that back down again and you can erase it and start over. So if you don't like it, you can, you can, that's scrimshaw is a little bit forgiving in that sense. See, I'm sanding it away and it's starting to take what I just did out, but then you would have to go back through the steps to, to polish it back up again. You know, you, you spend a lot of time carving this mask out. You're going to want to finish that surface because when you go to paint it, and I actually saw this happen here not too long ago, somebody didn't quite sand it as well as they should have, and they were, you know, kicking themselves in the butt a little bit about, oh man, I should have really, I should have really uh, sanded that more because they were having to go back after painting it because it really pronounced how rough the piece was. They had to go back, take the paint off, sand it down again, and repaint it, um, and it, you know, just adds a few extra steps. And that's kind of where Margie was talking about patience taking your time with the piece kind of trying to do a good job of it and as i showed you with the piece here um that i was showing you know showing an example of if that ink gets on the unfinished part of it it actually stays and you'll have to sand that part off um, but it wipes off really nicely when it's got a nice smooth glassy finish so we'll go ahead and let everyone kind of work on that. Um, if you guys are done sanding, feel free to go move right into drawing on your piece. And again, then we'll need to start getting the, uh, the etch pens out for everybody so that everybody will have to start doing that. Um, Margie, I'm going to go ahead and sand, uh, try and sand this ivory piece down. You know, if Margie has that story she was talking about, I feel like I, I'm relying on Margie a lot. <laughs> Yes, I have a story. I told you guys a story while everybody's busy with their um, project. And the story that I found, I had told you guys about the raven being a trickster. 
He loves doing things behind everybody's back and he just loves um, being a trickster. So this is a different version of how the um, raven turned black. <clears throat> the other one was about, um, he. the first story I told yesterday was ravens were um, traditionally pure white, beautiful white from the tip of their beak to the tip of their feet. They were pure white, but he ended up um, wondering and worrying about uh, people living in the darkness. And he knew that that chief had three boxes. That's the story I told you guys. And the raven went through a um, smoke hole and that's how he turned black. This one is a little bit different. It's very short, but I'll tell the story while you're working on your project. <clears throat> How Raven Turned Black. One day, Raven was flying around and, as usual, was looking for something to eat. At dusk, he noticed a lone house, so he lighted by the smokehouse. Oh, so he flew to the smoke hole and peeked in. When he saw an old woman making a kudak, this is traditional Eskimo ice cream, Raven flew down to the porch and landed making a lot of noise. Then he said from outside, of the um, house. Uzzuh, akuta makchikehna, chicken rishkuna, nachchikamken. He said, Hey, lady in there, if you don't give me a kutak, I will come in and eat you up. The old woman, thinking it was some kind of chagayak or some kind of monster, became frightened and threw her akuta out, saying, Kita, nakhriu. Kita is here. Nakhriu is eat, eat it. She heard something eating very noisily. When it was quiet, she peeked out, but she didn't see anything. And she went and got her pan. The next day, the old woman made more akuta. Just when she finished making her akuta, she heard a loud noise on the porch and a deep voice saying, which is to say, lady, oh lady, if you don't give me your akutak, I'll come in and eat you up. This happened for a couple more days until the old woman became curious about what that big old monster looked like. The old woman made her akuta again. She whipped and whipped and made the best akuta she could. She dumped her berries into the akuta and gently whipped and with until everything was all whipped and it looked very, very delicious. When she was done, she wiped her hands clean, picked up her pan and walked out on the porch. 
she took that big pot of akuta on the porch and she walked back to her hut and she hid herself with fur and she had one eye eyeing the pot of Bakutak. She waited till the monster came. Then she, she noticed that to her surprise, all she saw was this white bird. She looked more carefully. It was a white raven eating her akutak, smacking away, licking his tip of his feather. And then he said, The monster said, I'll come again tomorrow. And she, she just was very, very quiet watching the, akuta, the white raven eating her akuta. Then she thought, what am I going to do about this white raven that has been tricking me? She said, I'm, I'm going to get back at him for scaring the daylights out of me, she thought. Tomorrow, she said it again, I will scare the living daylights out of him. Then she gathered ashes after the raven took off. She gathered ashes and soot from her fireplace and began to make a gutak out of them. She whipped then whip the ashes gently because ashes tend to fly. And she added soot. Soot is really dark black. It's like charcoal. She mixed these up very carefully and made a kutak out of them. When she was done, she set the pot right next to the door washed her hands and went to bed. The next day, the old woman and the Panavakuta were waiting. Again, as usual, she heard a loud noise on the porch. Then the deep voice said, Akuta Taizgu. Bring me the akuta, or I'll walk in and I'll eat you up. This time, the old woman came out, came out. This time, the old woman came out and took that pan of akuta, which was a mixture of asses, ashes and soot. And through this mixture, out the door, on top, all over the raven, the beautiful white raven. And she said, please, 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 please don't eat me. I'm just an old woman. Soon the lady, old lady, heard choking sounds. And when she peeked out again, she saw the poor old raven had turned black from the, from the soot he had eaten. He was black from the tip of his beak to the tip of his feet. And that's how ravens turn black. That's the second story I, I uh, was able to locate while you were doing your um, instruction. How the raven turned black.
Thank you so much, Margie. That's awesome. I, uh, you know, and that's uh, so many stories I've heard about like how the killer whales have come to be and, um, you know, why seals are so important to the, to our people. And it's, it's just, it's really fun to always hear these stories. Um, and you know, each, each region is going to have a slightly different, um, when it comes to when it comes to seals, I've heard different stories from Kodiak than what I hear up towards like um, the Nome area and stuff like that. You know, different 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 things. So it's it's just it's wonderful. I love I love hearing all these. That's I always grew up listening to my grandpa tell us stories too. Yeah. So the the reason, and I just should probably touch on the reason that we're using car, uh, caribou antler instead of ivory. Uh, do the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, it's re they really kind of restrict on who can handle ivory and sea mammal pieces. And so when it comes to teaching classes like this, um, anyone who is not Alaska Native wouldn't be able to handle the material to be able to do these art forms. Um, they can handle, you know, they, they can, you know, buy and handle things that have already been created into art. So with the caribou antler pieces, you know, it gives you the same kind of texture, same kind of, you know, material. Um, and it's, it's something that we can, you know, have that everyone can take part in. And that's really, that's kind of why we were going with the caribou antler pieces. Um, there's also pieces though that people have used like full moose antlers, sanded down the raw, the outside part of the antler, and then did full scenes in the antler with scrimshaw. They've had, you know, entire, entire layouts. And those are really awesome pieces to hang up on the mantelpiece or on the wall. It looks like everyone's just busy work, working away. Oh, that's cool. Got more pieces. That's awesome. Now, did anyone get ink on themselves? That's that's the part, you know. Already, Jill, I was going to check in with you. How's your soap carving coming? Already. We're getting to that time too now, and I see some people cleaning up and that, yep, absolutely. We start kind of picking up the rooms and kind of cleaning up a little bit too. You know, got a little bit of dust everywhere. That's kind of what happens here with this. Um, and we can, you know, we can go forward. And like I said before, if any of the teachers, I would love to have photos of some of the done pieces, you know, just something that we could, we could share as well. I'd really like to see those. Um, and just kind of show other students, you know, what, what we're going to be offering in the future.